Hi, my name is Stefan Zhu, and I'm pleased to spend the next 15 minutes or so with you talking about responsible and ethical AI for cyber. I'm coming at this from the Intercept division, where we have spent the last several years, almost a decade now, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to solve what we think are some of the most important problems in the world. But of course, like they say in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. I wanted to always make sure that whenever we do think about AI, that we deploy that AI in a responsible and ethical manner. So I wanted to basically discuss this in three parts. I do want to touch on why it's important. I think it feels very obvious to us, but it's useful to take a look at the motivation behind responsible and ethical AI. But then I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the technical challenges in building such a system but of course I don't want to just leave it at that I want to give you some pointers and best practices and design patterns on how to move forward on implementing your responsible and ethical AI system so let's just dive right in let's talk about why it's important obviously ever since the release of GDPR there are some very important regulatory implications some some financial implications if you don't be respectful of data privacy, and if you implement um, an AI system that really isn't quite as ethical as it needs to be. And that culminated for me with the uh, recent ruling by the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, the OCP, the OPC I should say, around the way the RCMP used Clearview AI's facial recognition system. In fact, they ruled that it violated the Canadian Privacy Act. So that's a maybe a, an extreme example, but it is, uh, I think, a realistic example of something that we do need to consider in all of our AI systems. Is it actually implemented in such a way that is basically compliant with the laws of the land? So that's obviously the stick. But more important, I think, is, is the carrot. An ethical AI system is not only easier to sell, it is actually easier for an end user to adopt. Right? I think end users, the human beings at the end of the system, are more likely to take advantage and really benefit from all of the good stuff that can come out of AI if they are comfortable with the fact that their data is being treated respectfully, if that there's a uh, little to no risk of anything being stolen in case of a data breach if they uh, if they are just aware that you as a vendor or as the designer of the AI system is even sensitive to and able to speak to some of the protective measures that you've put in place around ethics and responsibility an opaque system is harder to test than a transparent system. So the more ethical it is, it turns out to be easier to test. And quite honestly, it's simply the right thing to do. So that's the carrot. But as I said earlier, it is hard. It's hard to anonymize location data as one simple example to start off with. There was a good study done in 2013 where they showed that if you had two random locations about an individual, you can actually identify at least 50% of them. Whereas if you have more random locations up to four, you can actually identify 95% of all individuals. That might seem counterintuitive, but let me give you a quick example. Let's suppose that I didn't know who you were, but I had two addresses about that I knew about you. I knew where your home address was and I knew where your work address was. And you can imagine that if I had just those two addresses, I could probably figure out, even if I didn't know your name, who you were. Keep in mind that home and work addresses are readily and easily obtainable from data brokers and public data sources. So that's a good intuitive example. Of course, the fact that the more I know about you, the harder it is to anonymize, that's pretty intuitive and not surprising and in fact it really t leads us to the second reason why it's so hard anonymization basically is increasingly difficult with wider data sets back in the day when all we had were census surveys with around 30 questions uh, if i only had 30 data points about an individual then it might be challenging to figure out who that individual is but nowadays, if you look at a system like Facebook, Facebook literally has thousands and thousands of data points about each individual. And so if that much data with that wide a column in your data set 
it's just really difficult to perfectly anonymize um, who that individual is. I want to give a really interesting example, which is from Netflix. Now, back in 2007, Netflix had at least 400 columns per user. And that information was known because it was released as part of a competition that Netflix had caught the Netflix prize. The Netflix prize was basically an attempt by Netflix to release data about the ratings of anonymized individuals on their various movies and they basically were hoping that people would be able to find a better recommendation engine so you liked these movies you'll probably like this movie so that's why they released this data set all it had were these 400 data points uh, on individuals that were had no names uh, but you knew which movies they liked and which movies they didn't like. Well, a couple of very clever computer scientists were able to sort of take that perfectly anonymized data from Netflix and combine it with movie rating data from IMDb, and they were able to essentially reverse the anonymization. So, if, for example, if you liked a bunch of movies on Netflix, we didn't know who you were, but they were able to see the same pattern of liking movies and disliking movies on IMDb, and they and you used your name in IMDb, well, you could very quickly figure out who that person was. So that's essentially what they did. But that's a very obvious linkage attack in, a, in some cases, in some sense of the word, you know, movie data with movie data. Yeah, you can kind of see how that would work. But you know what? The problem with linkage attacks is that sometimes uh, it's not obvious in advance what data sets can be tied to your perfectly anonymized data set. And I think a good example of that is something that happened in 2015 where uh, the University of Houston was able to take New York City cab data, which had information around the route and the, uh, the tip amount and the, cap, the size of the fare, and they were able to combine that with essentially photographs taken by paparazzi uh, of celebrities getting in and out of taxi cabs in New York City. And by combining these two data sets, which at first glance seems unrelated, they were able to essentially figure out who the good tippers and the bad tippers were among the celebrities that had their photos taken. So it was really quite an interesting article to read. I strongly encourage it. Uh, spoiler, Bradley Cooper, very, very bad tipper. Uh, so was Jessica Alba, apparently. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I want at least one positive example. Catherine, good job with your tip. Of course, there's all kinds of technical reasons why um, building a, a responsible ethical AI system can be challenging as well. Explaining an AI model and why that model made the decision that it did can sometimes be very, very difficult. Uh, these deep learning models in particular, there are thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, so even billions of parameters it's really hard to be able to generate an explanation of the decision-making process in a way that is just comprehensible by an ordinary human. We've heard a lot in the news recently about model bias. Essentially, if your data set is uh, coming from humans that maybe have behaved in a very specific way around, say, racial bias, then all the machine learning model will do is learn that same behavior and repeat the sins of the past. So that can be challenging to machine learning algorithms. Uh, on the good side, we're at least able to quantify and detect model bias. So that's, that's a step in the right direction. At least detection is the first step in a sequence of corrections that we might be able to make. But this is still difficult. It's very tricky. There's a lot of subtleties in correcting for model bias. And so this is and remains an area of active research. But like I said, I didn't want to just leave it here. It's, it's important, it's hard, but we still need to do it. So let's talk about how you can build a system and design it to be ethical and responsible. And really starts from day one, right? So the first principle here that I'm a big fan of is privacy by design. If from the very beginning you design your system for privacy, for ethics, for responsible AI, then really that's the best starting point for you. Uh, and this can impact everything, everything from the data set that you choose to how you treat the data to the modeling that you 
that you choose, the algorithms that you use, uh, that all gets rolled up into what I call the mathematical architecture. And again, right from the day they want, you need to design it for privacy. A good example of that really is the COVID tracing application that you might have running on your smartphone. Honestly, it really doesn't matter uh, how, how relevant a role you think the COVID app has to play in, um, in suppressing the spread of COVID. What does, uh, I, I think is irrefutable, really is how private it is, how respectful of privacy it is, just from the very way it's designed, uh, the way it uses random numbers, the way it doesn't require any sort of GPS or location data at all, really well designed for privacy from the very beginning. The other principle that I'm a big fan of it's what's, is what's called data minimization. Use as little as data is required. Data that you don't have is data that can't be stolen. And so right from the very beginning, when you're engineering your features, you're trying to, with a specific goal of reducing the number of columns as much as possible, using techniques like dimensionality reduction, specifically picking certain algorithms because they require less columns than others, that all factors in and can really be helpful in your, in your goal of data minimization. And of course, just like how the technical stuff means that math is hard. The technical stuff also means that math is powerful. So techniques like differential privacy, where you can enforce statistical guarantees on how private that information is, very cool stuff. Federated learning, so you can distribute the machine learning models um, so that you can have different ways of splitting up the knowledge, so to speak, so that it's not all just in one place. So that when that one device gets compromised, it doesn't matter because it doesn't see the complete picture. Distributed learning, so very secure way of distributing um, keys and uh, key exchange. So very cool stuff as well. So there are techniques like you see here that can be useful in um, various aspects of designing and building a very private ethical AI system. And like I said, we've been sort of thinking about this a long time in Intercept. We are very proud of these guiding principles that we've developed here over the years as we've gotten more and more experience on solving the most important problems in the world. And I just want to call out number five and number six here at the bottom. I really think it's important to be transparent around all your AI systems. I really think it's important to embody ethical and responsible AI right from the very beginning from the design of the system to the deployment to educating the end user around what the AI does and what it doesn't do. All of that all factors in. And at the end of the day, that's really what matters. It's important to be ethical. It's important to be responsible. And I just want to thank everyone for spending the time with me to let me talk about how important this is and maybe some tips and tricks and techniques that might be helpful in your journey. Thank you so much.